Well, good morning. It's exciting to be here. First service was awesome. This service is going to be amazing to the Great Oaks team. Thank you so much for your hospitality. Pastor Jake, thank you for the honor of ministering the Word of God from this platform. I have known Pastor Jake and Aaron for years. We connected as they served in Green Bay for a little stretch there, and I am just grateful that God brings people across your path that are living great stories, and I was inspired to hear the story of their family then, but I'm also inspired now, so thank you for living a story for his glory, and Aaron, thank you so much for being a part of the book launch team. Um, She was one of the faithful few who actually replied to emails, so (laughs) I appreciate that more than you know. Hey, one line is better than no line, so we'll take it. So we are going to talk about something that is uncomfortable, but we've got to talk about it, and that is the subject of suffering. For those of you who weren't here last week and weren't able to view the short video that was played last week, I'll give you just a quick uh, recap of my family's story. About eight years ago now, my wife brought our 13-month-old daughter, Peyton, to the doctor for a checkup, and at this well-child visit, There was nothing that we had any concerns about. And so during the visit, her pediatrician looked her over from, you know, head to toe and um, said that Peyton was perfect. I mean, literally looked Marlena right in the eyes and said, your daughter's perfect. And so Marlena brought Peyton home and laid her down for a nap. And that evening, um, she never woke up. And so for now, for eight years, my family and I have been walking through the valley of the shadow of death, if you will. And so we never wanted this life. We never asked for this. But we've discovered a richness in the grace of God that is powerful. And I have to say, on the front end of our time together, that my family and I, we're living an incredible life. My marriage is healthy. Our children pray to Jesus every night. And that is what is possible because when Jesus is in the story, things can be better. And I hope you came today expecting God to speak to you. Because when we gather in his name, something powerful can happen. Because he is here. Now, about eight days ago, I was uh, sitting at home. 9 o'clock in the morning, and the National Weather Service blasted out a warning to our cell phones saying, severe thunderstorm warning, 70 mile an hour winds expected. So now I'm sitting on the first floor of my house waiting for the fun to begin. And sure enough, that storm hit with ferocity. In fact, so much wind blew through my neighborhood that I began to hear the sound of trees giving way underneath the wind. A massive tree fell across the road in my neighborhood. Trees on the edge of the lot in the village that I live began to snap and fall over. And then, just to punctuate the moment, the white maple outside of my house let go of a limb that came crashing down onto the power line between my house and the road. And I brought some pictures just so you can see. So that's what we got to experience and so I'll show you another picture you can see the power pole and then the next picture you'll see the culprit that separated the power line from my house and then you can see just the the mast that is separated now from the side of my house but after seeing all of that I have to say that my family fared really well in comparison to others in our community and the miracle in all of this is that there were no injuries across our entire community not a single injury. And uh, we're thankful for that. But my in-laws, unfortunately, uh, experienced some damage. They live across town. And so here's a picture of two huge pines that fell to the ground right next to their house. And we'll go to the next picture there, and you can see a little closer just how big they really are. And then we'll go to the last picture here, and you can see just how big those trees were. If you look closely, you'll see a structure um, formerly known as pergola, underneath the weight of those trees there. And like most storms, this one caught us by surprise. I went to bed Friday night not anticipating the storm. I woke up Saturday morning not thinking a storm would happen. But that's the way life works. Storms 
happen. And there are going to be moments where you and I experience things that push us past our limits, past our edges, past what we're comfortable with. And it's not going to be fun all the time. Several years ago, I was staying at a hotel and I had to use the elevator. And I was standing outside the elevator. I press the button and the doors open and I step inside and I'm all by myself in this elevator. I turn around. I select my desired destination. The doors close. The elevator begins its travel. Moments later, the lights flicker and the elevator jolts and then it continues. Moment later, the lights go off and the elevator stops. And now I am stuck in an elevator by myself in the dark. And if I just described your worst fear, I am so sorry. (laughs) I do encourage you to keep listening to hear if I ever made it out. (laughs) So now I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I've never been stuck in an elevator before. Is there a YouTube video I can watch? (laughs) So I, for the first time in my life, I've got a legitimate excuse to open up the oh no box. You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) And so I open that up and I press the oh no button. Nothing happens. I mean, nothing. No tone, no uh, ringing sound, no automated reply saying we're on our way, hold still. None of that. You see, that section of the city experienced a power outage. What did that emergency system need to function? Power and a massive oversight, a redundancy. Whoever designed that never put a backup power supply on that thing. And so now I'm like, okay, here we go. So I pull out my phone, and I still had internet, thankfully, so I Google the front desk. I call the front desk. The phone rings, it rings, it rings, and it rings, and it rings. What did the front desk phone need to function? Power. What did it not have? Power. So now I'm really starting to get nervous. Like, am I ever going to make it out? A couple moments later, I hear the sound of a metallic tool being used to open up the outside door above me, a floor or two. And I hear this voice yell down the shaft in my direction. Hello? (laughs) I'm like, yes. (laughs) And then they asked a question that I still to this day, I don't know why they asked it. They said, Where are you? (laughs) Really? (laughs) If I have to answer that question, I've got another problem I have to solve now. So then (laughs) they yell down the shaft, we're coming to get you. I'm like, okay, I'll be right here. (laughs) See you soon, hopefully. Moments later, I hear the same metallic sound being uh, made on the other side of the door. And then I hear it again on the inside of the door. And the elevator had stopped about two feet above the floor. And I saw two of the most angelic faces I had ever seen in my entire life. Now, they were maintenance men, like Larry and Chuck. I don't know. But they were my rescuers. They came to me in my darkness, opened up a way for me to leave my darkness. And in the same way, we have a hope named Jesus who does the exact same thing for us. See, this gospel is good news. It's a story of God's love who sent his son to come down and he pursues us. He comes to us and he helps us turn around and go his way into life, into freedom. And how, how does that apply to suffering? Well, it reminds us that God is close to the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. He is the ever-present help in the time of need. We serve more than a philosophy, church. We serve the risen Savior who overcame death itself and now stands to help you and I overcome Every day of our lives. As we dive into the word today, we're in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to go there. The scripture will also be on the screen. But we're going to start in verse 12. And Pastor Jake and the teaching team here have done a great job building all throughout this entire series, giving you line by line, precept upon precept, solid expository teaching. In verse 12, 
we see a verse that is not, it's not fun to read. And here it is. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Here's what we need to know. Suffering in life is not a probability. It's a promise. If you follow Jesus Christ, that's not an exemption from suffering. It's actually an invitation to suffering with a greater purpose. Jesus said it this way, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That word trouble in the original language means tribulation. When we follow Jesus Christ, we should anticipate that life is going to be difficult at stretches. Why? Because we're following the one who overcame every single thing you and I will ever face, and he secured victory for us in every single moment we will ever find ourselves in. This is the gospel that saves our soul. Jesus did what we could never do to give us what we could never earn so that we could have what we cannot live without. This is the good news. And so if you're going through a hard time, it doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong. It just means that we should Wake up every morning expecting that suffering is going to be a part of our journey. Jesus said that he's our peace. And I love that because peace is not the absence of opposition. It's the presence of someone greater. It's the presence of a powerful, steadfast Savior. Now, my father is deaf. So growing up, sign language was the primary language in our household. And uh, he was a single parent. And so in 1983, when my parents split, the courts awarded full custody to my dad uh, because my mom uh, had some, some challenges that she was working through. And uh, one day, I was sitting outside our three-story apartment building playing cops and robbers, you know, that childhood game. And we were on our bikes, and there were kids whipping up and down the sidewalk, and I was just standing there watching all of this happen. And this kid named Bobby flies by me on his bike. And the moment he flies by me, his foot slips off the pedal, and his rear end comes crashing down onto the bike seat. It shatters and a shower and shards of plastic are going everywhere. And all of us are like... Whoa. And we think poor Bobby, his, his game is over. Like, he's, he's done. He's not going to have any more fun. He disappears. Moments later, I hear the sound of what feels like a tornado coming around the corner. It's Bobby's mom. And Bobby's, like, right behind her. Now, did Bobby go upstairs and tell his mom the truth? That his foot slipped off the pedal and his rear end broke his seat? Bobby went up and told his mom that I broke his bike seat. So now his mom is mad as all get out, and she's coming at me, an eight-year-old, threatening to sue me and my family. <laughs> Sorry, I can't even say that <laughs> without laughing. It's ridiculous. But in the moment at eight years old, I'm like, I don't want to go to jail. I didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. So now my brother, who's four years older than I am, super fluent in sign language, super awesome in life, and he jumps in the fray. And so now I'm watching my brother and Bobby's mom, and they're just having this argument back and forth and back and forth, and I'm like watching a game of tennis. It was amazing. She disappears. We go upstairs and tell my dad. And he, he gets pretty, pretty mad. <laughs> now picture this. Everything I just told you, but in sign language. It's this awesome visual explosion. So now my dad, he's on his feet now, and he leaves our second floor apartment, goes up the stairs, and I'm like, what is he going to do? He's deaf, she's hearing, he can speak well, but he can't hear nothing well, and it was awesome. And so, you know, it's him, my brother, and myself. It's like this Oompa Loompa parade. We were excited, though, to just be present, and so he gets to the door, and he's 
He's knocking on the door. What is my deaf dad going to say to this mom? We were about to find out. And so we hear the sound of Bobby and his mom on the other side of the door. They tried to act like they weren't home, but they were whisper yelling to each other. How many of you have friends that whisper yell? Maybe last night at the Chiefs game, you were trying to watch it, and you had that friend that was whisper yelling in your ear. Whisper yelling, let me just tell you this, it's, it's when you think you're whispering, but you're actually talking at a yelling decibel. If you don't know anybody who whisper yells, you might be somebody who whisper yells. And so my dad pounds on the door, he pounds on the door, he pounds on the door. Nothing. She never came to the door. Why? Well, by myself, I couldn't stand up to Bobby's mom. But when my dad was in the mix, there's a greater power there. And when you and I follow Jesus Christ, that's the greater power in the equation. So when we have opposition, when we experience suffering, when things seek to steal and kill and destroy from us, we can know that our Heavenly Father is the greater in the equation, and He is present. Now, will He stop all the attacks? No, He won't. And that frustrates me to no end. Have you ever had someone say, God would never give you more than you could handle? Weren't you tempted to give them more than they can handle? And then you could say, I'm not God. Jazz hands. Like, why do we say things like that? Why do we do that? Because it sounds true, doesn't it? It sounds so spiritual. It sounds biblical. But if you read the scriptures, you'll discover that God allowed his people to go through the unbelievably awful. In Genesis, he allows Joseph to be wrongfully accused for things he never did, put in prison. For years, in Exodus, God's deliverance of his people was stressful. If you read the escape from Egypt, they were scared out of their minds. Was it more than they could handle? Absolutely. In Hebrews, we read the story of God's people literally being sawed in two. So will God allow you and I to go through more than we can handle? Absolutely he will. But he will not allow us to go through more than he can handle. Jesus didn't promise us a comfortable life. He promised to be our comfort in life. And the difference is dynamic. I'll put it this way. Your perspective will either produce or prevent perseverance in your life. The truth you tell yourself every morning frames the edges of your day. And if you could tell yourself the truth, that suffering isn't a probability, it's actually a promise. Then when the loss comes, then when the pain comes, then when the person who you thought you could trust does you dirty, then you can know this is just part of the equation. This is part of following Jesus. Again, following Jesus doesn't exempt us from suffering. It's an invitation to suffering with a greater purpose. Now, when I was in high school, I ran cross country for one year. That's all I could take. Running's dumb. <laughs> Think about this. If you do it right, all you want to do is stop. Your heart pounds. Your body cries tears of pain. Some people call that sweating. <laughs> My body doesn't sweat. It sobs, church. Begs for mercy. Dan, stop it. Now, we had this one race in Duluth, Minnesota. It was the Swain Cross Country Race Invitational. As we're standing there at the starting line, there's hundreds of runners all around me. We're standing looking uphill. Yes, the sadistic race planners built a hill into the start of the race. Picture a soccer field uphill. So the starting gun goes off, we run a loop, and we had to run the same hill again. And then, just for kicks, they put the finish line uphill. It was awful. But that race taught me something about life. It taught me that my perspective, well, it, it means much. Is it a coincidence that the hill on which Jesus died was called Golgotha? That phrase means the place of a skull. What's inside of the skull? Our minds. 
What does a skull represent? Death. So is it possible that Jesus, on the very hill, that he secured the forgiveness of the totality of humanity for the depths of our depravity, is it possible there that Jesus also conquered the mind of death in our lives? And that gives us hope. Is it possible to think differently? 100%. But it's one of the hardest things you and I will ever do. If you've heard the phrase pathological, it, it's representative. The word beautifully represents what it means. When you and I think one thought, it's like walking across a field of grass. But then when we think the same thought again, the path begins to wear. And then we think the same thought a hundred times, it's like walking across the same stretch of grass a hundred, two hundred. And eventually it wears and then a rut begins to form. And that is a beautiful representation of our thought life. Now, is it possible to change paths? Yeah, it is. Romans 12, 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yes, it's possible, but it's going to take you and I making choices that are different. It's going to take you and I looking into the word of God and letting it speak to us. It's going to take you and I getting to church regularly to hear the counsel of Scripture shared. It's going to take you and I experiencing the Holy Spirit when we sing together, but also in our car and at home. It's going to take you and I choosing to saturate our purview with the Word, the Spirit, and the people of God. But it's hard. It takes discipline. And the beautiful thing about God's mercy is that every morning when you look east, you'll see this beautiful sunrise most mornings, actually. And that sun represents the mercy of God. Singing over you, singing over your day, promising he is with us, promising us another chance, promising in us another moment. But it all starts with our perspective. So let's choose a perspective that's productive. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. A friend of mine is a missionary. He served in Laos. He served in India. And he helped me understand what I didn't understand. That in America, our gospel um, can be awfully self-centered. But in our worldwide family, the gospel of Jesus Christ is powerfully changing people's lives. And here's the difference. In America, when bad things happen, when my daughter died, my first thought, God, is why me? And think that's what we all think. God, why? Why me? And then when good things happen, that's when we we're like, yeah, thanks, God. But in the worldwide family of God and other countries where your brothers and your sisters of the faith, when they suffer, their attitude is, thank you, God. And then when good things happen, their response is, God, why me? I don't deserve your grace. And there's a gratefulness that flows. We have to remember that suffering is not a probability. It's a promise with a purpose. Here's one purpose. To reveal God's glory through your story. Another purpose is to draw you closer to Jesus. Now, my wife, we've been married now for be 17 years this Saturday coming up. And uh, after um, we got married, she started getting migraine headaches. You can see the correlation there. I hope there's no causality. but <laughs> And these migraine headaches are awful. For the first 10 years, three days a month, she'd be in bed. 
If you've ever had a migraine, you know what this is. Like you, you have to be in a dark room, pillows over your head, sound hurts, light hurts. But in the past six and a half years, the headaches have gotten worse. And in 2015, it's like a bomb went off in her health. And she began to have migraine after migraine after migraine after migraine. At the end of 2015, she was in bed for 20 days straight with a migraine. And in the last two months of that calendar year, she was in bed over 40 days between the two months. And then in 2016, it got worse. She was in bed six days a week for two months straight. And I don't know if you've ever come to the end of yourself, but it's terrifying. Because when you realize that the gas tank of your soul has nothing but fumes in it, it's a pretty helpless feeling. But in March of that year, I, I believe I heard God speak to my heart. And this is what he said. He told me that you're, you're through the worst of it. And then by June of that year, Marlena went from having you know, 20 to 24 days of headaches every month to just 10 to 15. And we were so thankful. And she's had better months since then. But just this past winter, it got bad again really bad and she had to go to the doctor because she's not able to keep fluids down and it was getting scary and I I remember Marlena's mom who works at the same clinic talking to one of her co-workers who helped Marlena during that visit she said I don't know what it is but every time your daughter comes in just feel the presence of God. So here's my wife, past the limits. She's in so much pain. But in the midst of the worst part, God is shouting his glory through her agony. And that's what God does. That's how powerful he is. And so I would encourage you today, if you're at the spot where you feel like you've got nothing left, if you've got nothing left to give, and you're past all reason, you just don't understand it anymore, I want to call you to faith. To stop leaning on your own understanding. To acknowledge the Lord in all you do and watch him make your path straight. There's something powerful that takes place when you and I humble ourselves before the creator of all things. We admit our frailties. We admit our faults. And we confess our need for him. He pours out grace. He's close to the humble. He's near to the brokenhearted. So if you are brokenhearted, there's good news for us. There's good news. Truth that is uncomfortable, but it must be said, Jesus didn't come to make life easy. He came to make life abundant. As you and I learn how to suffer well, to embrace the cross, to follow Jesus, we have to remember this truth. Now is not forever. Several years ago, I was at a movie with some friends. And at this movie, it was Avatar in 3D. For the second time, I had my shades on, you know, the blurry ones when it's normal. And then when the movie starts, everything's like super awesome, those shades. And as I'm watching the movie, I'm noticing my left eye is burning just a little bit. And tears are starting to come down the one side of my face. And if you've ever seen Avatar, it's not that kind of movie. You really don't cry at that movie unless that tree scene wrecks you and you just really connected with the Navi people. And if you've never seen Avatar, this is all you have to do. Take Dances with Wolves and Smurfs, and merge them. You've seen Avatar. That's, you've seen Avatar if you've done that. And as I'm watching this movie, tears are pouring down the left side of my face, and I'm like, what in the world is going on? And so I find a mirror at the end of the movie, and I look in the mirror and discover something is not right. Now, my friends and I, we all go to Culver's, which is what Jesus would do. 
You can read about it in the book of editions. It's right after second hesitations. It's not there. Don't go looking for it. But we're at Culver's and I'm still crying out of half my face. I go to take a drink out of my soda. I can't form a seal around the straw. Liquid squirts out of the side of my mouth, down onto my shirt, and I'm beginning to wonder, what the world? And my friends are starting to worry too. Like, why is Culver such an emotional experience for Dana? So I get home. I look in the mirror. This side of my face is paralyzed. Completely paralyzed. I look at Marlena, and I'm like, look at me. And she says, it's not that bad. And I'm like, point of order. If half my face not working is not that bad, how ugly was I before this happened? (laughs) A man's got to know, I'm just saying. Get to the doctor the next day. He says, you have Bell's palsy. Take these pills in two weeks. You'll be fine. I started popping those like Flintstone chewables. I wanted to get better. That joke was for everybody my age and older. I had to tape my left eye shut every night to put eye drops in my eye four times every hour, not for one week, not for two weeks, not for three weeks, and not for four. Not for one month, not for two months, not for three months, not for four months, and not for five. In fact, today I'm still not all better. I've got about 90% of my face back, and so everybody over here, you win. Everybody over here, so sorry. I wish I could give you more. I can't. Um, But I learned something in that season. And now is not forever. The tough times, they start and then they stop. And even if a trial may rob me of my final breath here on earth, we've got a hope that extends beyond the grave. What does that mean? What you see is not what you get. What you see is what you must get through. After my daughter died, I entered a pretty deep depression. And it was too much for me. But I learned that Jesus was near to me. I learned that his presence was ever faithful. I learned that he is with me. And I was grateful for that. Now, that doesn't make it easier, but it sure brings hope. Verse 15, if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. When we suffer as Jesus followers, we're supposed to look different. Who in your life is watching you right now? As you go through your hard time. Who's paying attention? Because you and I have an opportunity to reveal the glory of God. In the midst of our mess. But that means you and I have to cherish our choice. We have to cherish our choice. Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl. Wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And in this book, he details the atrocities of the pure evil of the Nazi regime's plans to exterminate the Jewish people from the face of the planet. And he said it this way. People may be able to take away your possessions. Circumstances may be able to take away your positions and titles. But nothing can take away our power to choose. Even when we feel like we've lost it all, Jesus still gives us the ability to choose. In other words, your response is your responsibility. When we go through hard times, it's up to us to choose wisely. And that's easier said than done. In fact, uh, there's a moment I'm not very proud of at all. It happened after my daughter died wrestling with lots of anger. I was so mad at God. I was so mad at life. I was so wounded by the loss of my, my girl. And I was trying to build some frames in my father-in-law's workshop. They were five feet wide and three feet tall. And my friend Eric was going to stretch a canvas over the front of that and paint pictures in front of students in Wisconsin that week. And we were going to be in public schools, and students were going to be encouraged 
But like every project you and I undertake, sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't. And this project was not going well at all. And I'm sitting here getting more frustrated and more frustrated. And I snapped. I literally lost my cool. I I lost my composure. And furious words echoed off the shop walls. Pieces of wood flew across the workbench. And I stood there breathing heavily because these hands snapped that frame to bits. And all of a sudden, a warm presence filled the room. And I watched as those pieces of wood began to reassemble themselves magically in front of... Do you believe that? You shouldn't. (laughs) Where were those pieces of wood? They were on the floor in front of me. Whose job was it to clean up? It was mine. If we're in a habit of reacting to our pain in a way that's causing destruction in our lives, there's a better way. And it's, it's found in Jesus. If you've been wounded by people in your life who have really done you wrong, and they, they, they've, they, they've just so pushed you past your limits, there's a better way. Instead of reacting in pain and wounding them back, the call of the cross is to forgive them. After our daughter died, we had some of our closest friends respond to our pain in a way that was unbelievably hurtful. And it created an ugliness inside of me that I'm not proud to say was there. But at some point, I had to choose to forgive. And all forgiveness is, here's a definition, it's letting go of your right to hurt them back. It doesn't mean you trust them again. It doesn't mean you let them back in. It means you've let go of your right to hurt them back, and you've given that right to God, who is so wise, so powerful, so able. But it takes you and I taking responsibility for our responses. Have you ever heard the phrase, time heals all wounds? I've traveled all the way from Wisconsin to tell you that that's not true. When I was in the eighth grade, I was playing a game of basketball at the local recreation center. And in this game, my lack of basketball skills are on full display. I am terrible at basketball, folks. Let's just be honest. And there was this girl there that I was really trying to impress, which is ironic because I couldn't play basketball. Apparently, I was a man of faith. And as I'm dribbling the ball, I'm going towards the hoop. I jump. My feet get tangled. In the legs of another player, I rotate, I land right on my back, right above my rear end, and I feel thunder shoot down both my legs. I found out later that I herniated a disc in my lumbar region, and it would require surgery. After the surgery, within hours of coming to, a nurse walks into my room. And she wasn't singing happy songs. She was saying really mean things to me. Like, get up. (laughs) I'm like, I don't want to. I don't want to. She goes, no, you need to get up. I'm like, are you crazy? Didn't the doctor tell you what he just did to me? She said, no, if you don't get up now, it's going to prolong your healing. In fact, had I stayed in that bed after that surgery, I would have run the risk of infection, blood clotting, which is really bad. And so I had to rehab. I had to do things that were hard even though they hurt. And the rehab exercises for a Christian, faith, trusting God, Forgiveness, letting go of the pain, moving forward, and then practicing self-forgetfulness. You can be a part of God's redemption of your story. You can be a part of watching him do the impossible through the unbelievable. Let's continue. Verse 17, it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And I hope that verse haunts you. 
Because you and I, once we follow Jesus Christ, we stand under his umbrella, his covering, his grace, and we don't live in condemnation anymore. But for those of our coworkers, our family members, our friends, other classmates, they, if they've not responded to the call of the cross, it's danger, Will Robinson. It's, it's not good. And so we should, as a church, not just think of ourselves when we're in pain, but we should be thinking of others too. We should be asking the question, what about them? Because that's the heart of the gospel. It's always for the outsider. It's always for the one who's not on the inside. It's always for the one who desperately needs hope. Verse 18, and if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Verse 19, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Have you committed yourself fully to the creator? Have you done it yet? Because it's ultimately our decision. Jesus calls us all by name. He invites us all into the journey. But ultimately, he calls us. But it's us, up to us to respond. The last thought I'll leave you with is there's always an after. There's always an after. If now is not forever and you cherish your choice, you can know that there's always an after. We bought a house about four years ago, and you saw it on the pictures earlier. Now, let's be honest. When you buy a house, you don't really buy a house. You buy a project list. And in this journey of home ownership, lots of surprises have happened. But one of the greatest surprises happened a year and a half ago when our neighbors lost their daughter. Suddenly and unexpectedly. And it's, it's overwhelming to think about that. That God was able to redeem our pain in such a way that now we get to walk alongside of a beautiful family going through a very similar loss. And that's why you and I have to keep going. That's why you and I must choose to persevere. Because on the other side of pain, there is promise. On the other side of hurt, there is hope. There is a reason to keep believing because our God does not waste a single thing. He is so powerful. He is so able. He is so creative. Have you ever heard someone say, everything happens for a reason? Doesn't that sound like God is causing everything to happen for a reason? If you rewind the creation story all the way back to the book of Genesis, you'll discover that God doesn't cause everything to happen for a reason. You see, there's Adam, there's Eve, there's perfection, and there's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says, if you touch that, if you eat that, you will surely die. It will not be good. Don't do that. So God says, enjoy all of this. No touchy. He, really simple. Why didn't God just pull the tree out of the Garden of Eden? Wouldn't that have simplified everything? Wouldn't that have just made this way more simple? Well, the reason why he didn't do that is because he knows that to have real love, you have to have a real choice. And God desires a real love with his children, with his creation, with his people. So here's what I've come to learn. God does not make everything happen for a reason. He gives a purpose to everything that happens. Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That phrase causes all things to work together for the good. In the Greek language, it's synergeo, which means he causes things to collaborate. So God is able to take the darkest night, the most painful pit, and to make those details collaborate for our good. If you're walking through a tough time today, I came to encourage you to keep going, to trust the Lord, to embrace the cross, and to follow Jesus. Because there is an after. There is a good that God is working out for all of his children. It was several years after our daughter died that we were sitting in a camper. And my wife was nine months pregnant. You're probably wondering, Dan, why were you camping with a wife that was nine months pregnant? That's a great question, church. 
The campground was closer to the hospital than our home, so we thought, it's a safe bet. <laughs> so at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, I'm on one side of the camper, um, and then Marlena is on the other side of the camper on that super generous three inches of plush foam, you know, that super comfortable foam. It feels like a paper towel was rolled across a paper to- or tabletop, you know, that kind of foam. And she says the words that resurrected me out of a dead sleep. My water just broke. And sure enough, it had done been broken. And so we gather ourselves up, and we zip to the hospital, and it was a scheduled C-section, but that schedule was obviously changed, and so I'm now standing outside of the OR watching the team of medical professionals prepare for this moment, and the doctors are scrubbing in, they're talking, they're having just great conversation. I'm like, wow, you guys are really calm. You're about to cut my wife in half. Apparently this is no thing. And so I'm watching them scrub in, and it's a ritual. If you've ever seen a doctor scrub in, or if you ever have an opportunity to see a medical professional scrub in, invite the children. And this is what you can do. You can say, look, kids, they use soap. It's awesome. And so I'm sitting there waiting for this moment, and the doctor's going in and out, and then the door opens, and I hear the nurse say, all right, Dad, we're ready for you. I walk in to the right of the room there. There's that amazing warming table that has space age technology that I still don't understand but it's awesome there's a doctor there ready to take care of our daughter team of nurses there and I walk past the table and Marlena is secured to the table and I go up by her head and the anesthetist is seated and that's a really great job you get to sit down while everyone else is standing (laughs) that's a good gig and so The doctors are all having conversation with each other, and I'm not kidding. This is the second C-section I got to witness. The first C-section, Marlena's attached to the table. The doctors are talking, and no joke, this is what the doctor said to the other doctor. I barely recognized you at the grocery store the other day because you weren't wearing your mask. I'm like, oh, my gosh, really? (laughs) Hashtag doctor humor. So the moment came back to when Camden was born. And they're talking, they're talking, they're talking. And all of a sudden, silence. And they go in, and they retrieve her, and they hold her up, Simba style. And they bring her to Mama. And they whisk her away to the warming table. They clean her all up. And they say, all right, Dad, come on over. And they had wrapped her up like a little burrito. And they put her in my arms. And the only thing I could do was weep. Because when Peyton died, part of me died too. I didn't want to trust anymore. I didn't want to feel anymore. And for months and years, I just went numb. But as I held Camden for the first time, all I could do was weep, but also thank God. I don't know what you're going through, but I do know this. Jesus is near. He's present. As we think about our time together, we need to remember that now is not forever. We need to remember to cherish our choice. We need to remember there's always an after. There's a verse in Psalm chapter 23, verse 4. It says this, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. At first glance, that verse feels heavy and ominous. Valley, shadow, death. That's heavy. But take a closer look and you'll discover a power. We'll create shadows. Light. The only reason why death has any ability to cast a shadow over us is because Jesus is the greater light above death, disease, dysfunction. He's conquered it all. And now he's not only the greater light above us, in his sovereignty he strides with us and he's going to give us 
victory in the end. That is the hope of following Jesus Christ. That is the benefit of stopping to go your way and to start going his way. And so if you have yet to start following Jesus Christ, I'm calling you to faith today. In a moment, our prayer partners will be at the side of the room and they're ready to walk with you forward to give you what you need to do next. Following Jesus will be the best decision you'll ever make. It'll also be the hardest decision because you'll have to stop going your way and just start going his way. If you're in this room and you're in the midst of a season of suffering and you just don't know how you're going to make it, again, the prayer team, they're ready to stand with you. They're ready to help you. You're not alone. You're going to make it. Let's choose to suffer well. Let's choose to trust, even when it's hard.